Thanks everyone. So kicking off this morning, I wanted to talk about sort of ready for next and what's coming and link together some of the ideas that we're going to be talking about in the sessions later today. Uh, there's lots of kind of crazy future stuff we can talk about. There's programmable genetics and quantum computing and all kinds of fun things, saving the world and whatever else Elon Musk is up to this week. But what I want to focus on is kind of the near uh, future, the current wave of technologies, stuff that's quite actionable that we can go out and um, actually start to play with after this conference and then look a little bit further beyond that. Um, what I want to share is how I see some of these technologies relating. So how do bots relate to mesh Wi-Fi or how does quantum computing relate to Greek swimming pools? Um, so putting all of these different things in context. I'm not going to pretend that I can go into any level of depth on all of these different things. It's not an amount of time for that and you can't know all these things. So that's where the other people will talk through it. So kicking off with that, I guess who am I and how do I get to talk about this sort of stuff? Um, so I'm the head of development at Redify, so I run the software development group there, which means I get to spend a bunch of time thinking about these technologies and how do they relate to our business and the community in general. Um, I come from a software dev background. I think this is the fifth DDD Sydney, which also means it's the fifth one I've been to. Um, and uh, yeah, quite enjoy being part of this community. So a lot of different places we can start, but we've got to pull the thread somewhere. So let's start at Interface. Um, interface is obviously something that we're very good at as an industry, and that's how we've gone and built things like this. And we've trained everybody out of reading long form news and uh, has gone and kicked off um, all sorts of fun. Um, there was obviously quite a lot of resonance with this tweet here. Now, how can we improve on this? Well, chatbots have already been mentioned and uh, they're a pretty rapidly growing solution. Uh, we're right next door to the ABC News building. I actually get my news using the ABC News bot on Facebook Messenger as the kind of primary initiative in the mornings. Um, why would I go and do that? Well, one, I'm kind of on the edge of the millennial crowd, so therefore we have to do everything through messaging apps. But uh, it has alerts, um, so I get push notifications when there's major breaking events, and I get a 7.30 a.m. summary every day and all those kinds of things. Um, it dynamically adjusts my time zone when I travel. Every time I go and sign in to Facebook or Messenger, they, it knows, it passes that information to ABC and it dynamically adjusts the notifications that I get in the morning to kick off the day. Um, it works across my phone and my laptop and it has a familiar interface that I know how to use uh, just being in the messenger interface. So that's kind of all well and good as a start, but I want to park the idea of the bot. Bot is kind of, in my mind, the server side logic and I want to focus on the conversational interface that sits behind this. So the idea of um, this kind of single flowing uh, conversation that's largely text-based and uh, my reaction to a lot of these kinds of things initially when people talk about the rise of mobile is kind of like I don't really want to do everything on mobile I hate doing online banking on mobile and I hate booking flights on mobile so why do I want to be constrained to these sort of tiny little interfaces but there's a few different people who are going and pushing this along one answer is access so there's a particularly um, awesome Australian uh, in the dev community, Ben Schwartz. He organises JS uh, Conf Down Under and CSS Conf. And uh, he goes and builds an app called Calibre App. Calibre App's focused on web performance. But as part of that, he went and compiled some data last year, 2016, about the number of hours you need to work at minimum wage in different countries to access a reasonably priced prepaid plan to get data. And these numbers are pretty phenomenal. The fact that you have to work 17 hours in India to get 500 meg of data, um, they're going to be pretty precious about their data limits, right? I, I complain about my sort of 150 gig, or no, 500 gig plan at home that I have and the 15 gigs I have on my mobile. Um, can't imagine them trying to afford that. Um, so that's one aspect of it, but uh, it's still quite expensive in a lot of parts of the world. The other aspect is actually then speed. So even if we can get this data on mobile, it's quite slow, even on LTE. And then even when we, um, we have LTE, it's quite variable. The average speeds here uh, vary quite a lot. And then even then, 60% of the world's mobile connections are actually still on 2G. Or when you see it say Edge at the top when you go and travel to the US and then everything stops working on your phone because Edge is just sucking bandwidth through a straw of a glorified dial-up modem and not much more than that. So we've got this idea that data can be slow and expensive. The average iOS application at the moment is 38 megabytes. Now, that includes things like games. So if we exclude them and we just focus on the news category, going back to that ABC News example, the average size of a news app in the iOS store is 22 megs, just to deliver articles. Reasonable size. So um, 
these markets matter, right? There's a lot of people in here. India added 100 million people to the internet just in 2016. There was a new telco that spun up, Geo. They signed up something like 100 million people in less than 18 months from scratch as a brand new company. Can you imagine that kind of scaling challenge? Just ridiculous. And they've fundamentally changed the price over there at the moment. Um, it's dropped quite significantly for their data price. But they're still only 35% connected in India. So there's this massive global market that's coming online that's taking a little while to um, get the data in. And then Africa will be next. Targeting these countries, not only do we take the chatbot idea and then all the chat interface and scale that down to something like Messenger, Facebook actually even has Messenger Lite because one of the other things is the performance on the devices in terms of we have fancy phones, I have a Google Pixel, it has a whiz -bang CPU. A lot of people don't have phones like this and running all the animations and holding everything in memory is quite expensive and doesn't work on those devices. And then they also have a more optimized protocol. So they target Messenger Lite at these countries that have challenging access to data. Um, it's not available in all of the app stores because they target specific places, but you will find it in the Australian app store. So I wonder if that's a commentary on our relationship to Indian and African data access. So uh, that's one aspect. The other aspect is kind of generational and the, the changing expectations of how we interact with devices. And I came across this Twitter thread that um, uh, it was introduced to me as the idea of um, sort of getting old and realizing that people do things differently. And this was a, uh, an author, you know, he lives in Portland, and he was on a flight in the US and he was looking over somebody's shoulder in kind of the seat in front and watching this girl who was typing away, thumbs flying away on the phone. He thought she was texting. And then she continued texting after takeoff and she wasn't actually texting. She continued to type for the whole flight. And he estimates that she wrote three to 4,000 words on that flight and she was writing a novel of some form. And that was just natural for her, tapping away on that device. And as an author, his comment was, well, I can't do that. I didn't write anything on that flight. I have to go back and sit in my office and sit on my nice laptop and I can't fold it out on my tiny little United flight and all of that. But this is now a new way of working that's just natural for a lot of people. So we've got this kind of generational change that's coming through. We also then get into audience size. So the idea of easier access to a really large audience. Messenger and WhatsApp, both owned by Facebook, have a billion users each. Now there's obviously some overlap in that, but still a lot of users. And then WeChat has another billion users in China. So even for Australian brands, um, this was me booking my flight. Uh, Troy Hunt's not here, but I've blanked out all of my reference details so he can't steal my frequent flyer number or hack into my account. Um, but this is Qantas and they have a button there which is send to messenger. And that's one tap away. Now the way that's embedded in that web page, because I'm signed into facebook.com, it already knows my identity. One tap and they can deliver push notifications to me that works across my laptop, my mobile device, and they have a persistent channel to get to me. And all of a sudden, as a brand, they've now been promoted to my contact list of something that I can interact with from those devices. So you get instant access to this market rather than go install the Qantas app and sign in and, oh, what's your PIN number for your frequent flyer account and all those kinds of things. So we're seeing this kind of simplification from 2D interfaces to what works in 1D. So 1D being this idea of one dimensional or a conversation flows in a single direction. And it might be text-based or it might be voice-based. Um, obviously that's quite constrained and it's not perfect, but it does work for a lot of different scenarios. One of the things that I really quite like about it is this idea that conversational interfaces are universally accessible based on language. Anyone who's got language can interact with them. You don't need to understand a complex UI and how to use a mouse or um, how to interact with these kind of different complex IAs and just be able to use language to get there. They're also naturally accessible. So Microsoft over the last few years has gone into a really big push of accessibility. So um, blind users, uh, um, various kind of motor challenges, all these different types of challenges that um, are naturally accessible via conversational interfaces. That's how Stephen Hawking goes and in interfaces with us, right? Um, and then even the way that we use iconography, emoji is now a global standard. I just love the idea that we have a language that describes everything from objects through to emotions and it's well documented and it's understood. And uh, it's got, um, it, it covers diversity and personal expression. Um, it brings its own cultural idioms. So the, uh, the 100 and the double underscore comes from the original Japanese roots of emoji and like score of 100 on a school test and it's great. And it comes with its own story. And then it evolves its own ones of the smiling poop and interesting uses of vegetables. But uh, Something that started in Japan and then Google shared on their quest to make Gmail um, 
have better versions of emoticons and it's gone from there. And it was also one of these other things that started out very initially of when it came to text messaging was very much like uh, kids and their emoji and their smiley faces. But now we're seeing that every keyboard and every major OS, um, Mac OS, Windows 10, everything includes an emoji keyboard. And they're starting to drift into corporate communication even as well. Um, uh, I work for Edify, we're 270 people, our parent company's 36,000 full-time people, um, you know, big company world, and you still see emoji starting to pop up in the communications there. Um, and some of the research that the Google team found when they were looking into this was that people described it as the easiest way to apologise when words can't express enough, or when something just doesn't quite feel personal enough until it's very dry email if it just has words and, and stuff in it, and then you add some emoji and it gets some flavour, or it brings a smile and it softens the mood. They were all the types of comments they got. Um, I also love the idea that it's a visual language that's designed to be remixed. So emoji works based on um, these zero width modifiers and these Unicode streams. So cat zero width modifier, um, and that technical name of the second one is bust as silhouette. Uh, you put them together and Microsoft goes and says ninja cat, and that's how we interpret it. So it's a language that is standardized, but is also designed to be remixed and it's universally accessible. I just think that's really cool. Anyway, I digress down there. There's a Fast Company article from 2014 called The Oral History of the Poop Emoji, um, and it goes through all of the history about how Google brought it to life, and it's really quite cool. <laughs> so we have this kind of, this idea of 1D, universally accessible um, uh, by language, naturally accessible to a very diverse group of people and the widest possible audience. It'll also be increasingly extended by voice. Um, so text-based stuff is one side of it. Obviously voice is coming along as well. Uh, we've got all of the Alexas and Amazon Echoes and Siris and Cortanas and all of that of the world. Plenty of challenges still to solve there. You walk into a house of three people and you ask Alexa, what do I have on for the day and whose calendar does it respond with? I say, hey Cortana, and five devices respond to me. Or more specifically, I say, hey Cortana, hey Cortana, hey, uh, damn it, just pass me the device. Um, so, and then we get into dealing with all the complexity of human language and um, interpreting all that. So that's going to be a challenge. So continuing this kind of trend, one of the other ideas I like in this model is the idea of zero D or, or naught D. And this is the idea of ambient experiences, things that you don't directly interface with as a user but can exist around us. So the idea that when I get home that my house is automatically warm or that for the flight that I have back to Melbourne tomorrow that something can be constantly monitoring to see if my preferred seat becomes available and move it across. Or when I get more than four hours of meetings in my calendar on a day, which for my life would be amazing, um, then automatically block the rest of my calendar out because at some point I actually need to do some real work. Uh, all of these different types of ideas are things that we can go and build. Now as developers, they're background jobs, scheduled tasks, demons, whatever that you want them to be. But for a user, how do they get access to them? They're either that website that you forget that ever existed, so I could build some, you know, defendmycalendar.com and people do an OAuth to their calendar and then we monitor that and off we go. And then six months later when you want that behaviour to stop, what was the website that you signed up to? You don't remember. Or there's um, kind of aggregator websites like Ift, if this then that, they put lovely UX over relatively complex logic but it's still quite nerdy. How many non-nerds really use services like Ift? or you get the proliferation of apps. Install an app on your phone that manages your work calendar in exchange and then you've got like 100 screens of apps and, and all that kind of challenge. So um, this idea that uh, in kind of our conversational interfaces and, and those um, messenger type platforms and the idea that you can have Qantas that just becomes a contact of mine, why can't I have other uh, bots that pop up via a conversational interface and that's the way I kind of configure them and then they go and run in the background. So I get this really lightweight concept of adding something to a list or removing it from the list as opposed to installing and uninstalling and you get that much greater density of searching through the list. So I see kind of a future here where 1D or the conversational world becomes more of the, the consumer gateway to how do we go and configure these other ambient experiences especially when we're going to start to build in the appropriate analysis and complexity of language. Hey, when I get home, I'd really like the house to be warm each day. You know, can you sort that out? Now, every different application that we build, you don't expect an air conditioner manufacturer to be able to build something that advanced, and you don't necessarily expect the, uh, you know, the public transport system to build something that advanced. But then if we can start to put these um, uh, bots 
via their conversational interface in the same conversation and we can have a group message between them, then you start to get mediator bots that will jump in there as well. So this is where services like Siri and Cortana and everything can coordinate talking to the air conditioner, talking to Qantas, talking to um, Sydney trains and all of that. So I think that'll be kind of really exciting space that starts to open up, this idea of ambient experiences or zero D. Everything doesn't fit there, just continuing to boil it down there, right? 2D um, got us so far, and we're also seeing this massive growth in the 3D space. Um, we've got applications like HoloLens, which no doubt talked about a lot, and there's some outside if you want to play with them. Um, definitely getting really interesting different scenarios. Um, still based on screens, we're seeing also new technology, like this is the Glyph that launched last year. This doesn't actually even have a screen in it. It projects light directly onto your retina to make you see things. Um, rather than just kind of faking positioning through a, a bit of glass in front of you. So there's a, a huge amount of development going on here. And there's some predictions that um, by 2025, we'll finally have, which is not that far away, it's like eight years away, we'll finally have these lightweight form factor um, virtual reality type experiences built into glasses. It's kind of the latest prediction is 2025. So I really like the spectrum at the moment of the idea of 0D to 3D and the idea that we can plot all of these different things that are really exploding out either side of that 2D space. Not everything fits, of course. Um, I put AR in the middle as like 2.5D because often it's putting 2D on top of the real world um, as opposed to kind of more your mixed reality environment. The problem with so many choices here, though, is that we also want to be able to span across them, right? Oh, sorry, before I go on too much further, this 0D to 3D thing, um, I, that was in the Microsoft Fluent design language when they talk about some of their design goals for it. Um, and I just, that's where I got the concept from and I really like it. Nick Randolph is talking to, later today about the Fluent design language uh, in the third session. So the problem with so many choices here though is how do we have experiences that go and span them? You don't want to have to do everything on a HoloLens, everything talking to a bot and all of that. So we get into this idea then of ubiquitous experiences of how is that interaction that I have with a particular product or service or brand that just flows across all of them. Now, sharing state, it's kind of the easiest part of the problem. Um, we go and push some stuff up to a shared database or a service somewhere and ta-da, we're done. Getting the user experience right is gonna be really, really hard. So um, in the Microsoft world, they have Project Rome, which is, uh, it's Rome as in the city, R-O-M-E, because um, all their code names have to be places, but then Rome, nice double play there. Um, they have Project Rome, which is about those shared experiences of kind of your phone off to your Xbox and, and those sorts of things. But there's many different solutions. The experience is going to be hard, but what we're really relying on is a serious amount of connectivity between all these different devices as well. Um, so that kind of leads us on to the network. Um, back in 2007, the Amazon launched their Kindle. It wasn't this one, it was nowhere near this beautiful. But it was the first Kindle that had US coverage of 3G in it. But most importantly, you didn't subscribe to a service. You didn't go out to a carrier and get a service plan. You just turned it on and it just worked anywhere in the US. And you didn't even know what network it was on. And then in 2009, they expanded the international version of that. They had global 3G coverage via this um, amazingly complicated deal with mostly AT&T. Um, and then hiding SIM cards in the devices and then a big shared data plan. And they were able to do that because they were dealing with a relatively small amount of data in text. Um, and they were also able to build that into the cost of the marketplace. But I think that was kind of a phenomenal start to the idea of devices that are just naturally connected straight out of the box, not sitting there doing this pairing experience of trying to get it to work with your Wi-Fi. In 2014, Apple started shipping iPads that have generic SIMs in them that work across many different networks. So the Kindle solution was they shoved an AT&T SIM in it and didn't tell you about it. The Apple solution was they then start to have generic SIMs that will work with many different carriers and they can switch them in software so that you sub um, sign up for a service plan and off it goes. That works in the US. The next thing that we're starting to see though is that 4G is incredibly congested. It doesn't get into everywhere. At the end of the day, we still have Wi-Fi, right? 5G is of an interest to the networks to push because they want to get better management of the bandwidth space that's sitting across there, but it still doesn't always get everywhere. So the next thing that's launched, um, Telstra just turned this on a couple of months ago in Australia, is the idea of Wi-Fi calling. They have this on iOS and Android, where if that's turned on and your phone is connected to say your home Wi-Fi network, it will actually offload the call and go out through there. Um, my parents' house, they have like a sort of a, an underhouse pantry basement type thing and there's absolutely no phone reception whatsoever down there, but there's a Wi-Fi access point down there, and they can make and receive calls um, through that just purely over Wi-Fi. 
not using an over-the-top service like Skype or anything like that, but just using their stock standard GSM service. Now, where that's useful for networks is that they're then able to extend the coverage into more locations, which is all well and good. But what we are seeing is um, also more kind of local offload of the bandwidth. So we're not going and chewing up you know, 10,000 people all in Ultimo at the same time trying to use the same bandwidth. We get these local connections. So we get into this problem then, if we've got this growing concept of Wi-Fi, but how do we have devices that just naturally connect? You don't have to do a pairing experience on stuff like your scales, because there's no screen on your, your Wi-Fi scales. The next thing that's popping up then is Hotspot 2.0. Um, you'll find this buried in places like your Windows 10 settings, and it's sort of buried down the bottom there of would you like to find plans. Um, this is a significant um, standards kind of update from the Wi-Fi Alliance. And it takes all of those god-awful captive portal sign-in, type in your credit card into some random website in a cafe you've never seen experiences and makes them go away. It adds carrier-style concepts in terms of roaming uh, experiences onto Wi-Fi. So you can then take something where you um, connect to a hotspot 2.0 network, the OS pops up and says, hey, do you want to get a data plan for this network or do you want to use an existing data plan? You go, yes, and you can buy it through the Microsoft Store or you can bill it back to your Telstra bill or, or whatever's going on, even as you roam around the planet and it'll all go and link up on the background. So this is stuff that's being heavily pushed towards um, public locations like hotels and airports and those types of environments where they can offer a paid Wi-Fi service without having to, you to go through all of that sign-up experience and you can trust that it's secure. So as we start to then link this with carriers um, and we look at devices like, say, the uh, Amazon Echo, I can imagine a future where via carrier alignment or ISP alignment, your uh, modem at home is projecting both your own Wi-Fi network and a hotspot 2.0 position, um, similar to how Telstra publishes Telstra Air or Fon Wi-Fi off some of their home routers. But then actually having that where other devices can sign up for that so an Amazon Echo can turn up in your house, find a hotspot 2.0 network, establish a roaming relationship back to Amazon and actually pay for that bandwidth and naturally connect all the way through in a secure way. And we start to build this whole other layer to the internet. Um, of course, that comes with its own problems though of um, how many people actually have Wi-Fi successfully working in every corner of their house? Um, not many, maybe some people in this room. Ewan's nodding his head, of course. Um, done a whole network CAD layout for that for us. We'll get that later. Um, most people don't, unfortunately. Uh, so we've got all those kind of patchy problems. So we're seeing a renaissance of kind of mesh networking really starting to actually come back into play. We're seeing consumer mesh solutions that actually work in a useful way. And as we get more devices on, we might finally find a use for IPv6 as all these devices are popping up on everyone's different network. So it's kind of thinking about the network space. Um, all well and good then going and saying, right, well, we can have all of these different endpoints that can sit everywhere and they can talk back to a cloud and they can do shared state. But at the end of the day, you can't solve everything of just shoving it back at the cloud and trying to remote it. Um, even if you've got the bandwidth and the quota available, you don't necessarily, you can't support the latency to do real time work over it. Um, and uh, you may not have the battery power in a mobile device. You know, you sit there on a hotspot and it just kills the battery power. So then starting to lead into how do we think about intelligence? And how do we distribute this intelligence? Because it's really driving a change to where computing sits. So first of all, I'm using intelligence as a general overarching term for kind of um, artificial intelligence, AI, machine learning, a whole category of different things. There's a whole conversation in there about what fits where. Um, I'm not going to try to tackle that here. Go see Dom's session for the detail. Um, Dominic's talking later today, I think he's in the second session. Um, one of the applications here of um, sort of machine learning, um, Facebook actually rolled this out in November 2016. And this is where they're going and taking an existing uh, piece of art and applying that to a uh, video that somebody's going and filming. So they're doing this on the fly. They can do it in real time. So you can apply it like a filter, but they're doing it using machine learning. They don't sit there and apply all these different algorithms manually. What they can do is take a particular piece of famous art or an artist's style, train the deep neural nets, and then go and apply it to the video. So in this case, even if you had you know, wonderful 5G, you can't be sitting there filming with your phone and then having it pro send that up to the cloud, process it, and bring it back down. So they're actually doing all of this processing on people's device. 
part of the reason the Facebook app is so damn big is that they're shipping pre-trained deep neural nets down to the device. This is the same sort of thing that Apple started doing as well, where when you go into iPhoto and it categorizes everything as like dog, beach, sunset, and puts all those tags on it, because of their big privacy push, they don't want to push all of your photos up into the cloud. So they're pushing neural nets down to your phone, using that to go and do the categorization locally. It means that they're even able to, when you go and add tags and other information to it though, they can share the training information back to the cloud to make the, kind of the common good of everyone's devices and the overall network without actually having to share your data. So um, I just find this idea of kind of fascinating of the edge computing um, scaling back up again when we've spent quite the last sort of 10 years moving everything off the edge. So uh, thinking about then where do we go and apply intelligence and all these kind of machine learning and image classification and everything, there's so many different scenarios there. So I'm just going to pick a random one. This was from uh, 2010, it was from March 2010, sorry, May 2010, and uh, talks about, this is smack bang in the middle of the Greek, Greek debt crisis. Um, everybody had all, has all this wealth in Greece and none of it was showing up on a tax form. There was supposedly like less than a few thousand people in the entire 11 million person country that made over $130,000 a year, um, which there were plenty more than that. But one particular problem that they were looking at was pools because they tax people as swimming pools in some way. There's a checkbox on the tax return where you say, yes, I have a swimming pool. And there's obviously a bill associated with that. And in a particular um, region, they only had 324 people actually tick that box. So they went off and looked at some satellite imagery and they got a different number. They got 16,974 pools. There's a little bit of tax evasion for you. Um, and this is just kind of the scratching the surface of it. Now this says that investigators studied satellite photos. It doesn't sound very automated, but it obviously could be. This is the type of thing we can solve with a classification approach and that we can apply consistently and repeatably and, and so on and so forth. And I think one of the ideas um, around kind of where does machine learning and artificial intelligence play into our lives as software developers is more in the applications of these tools. Uh, the various kind of algorithms and approaches all come out of very academic environments or research and development shops that do an incredible amount of work there. And what we're starting with is predominantly mostly trained things for a problem, giving them a bit more training and then learning how to apply them to something and stitching that together is what most of our experience is going to be. So that's our predominant role going forward. Now, um, there's plenty of ways that we can go wrong when we go and start to apply this sort of stuff as well though, right? When we start to think through the social impacts of all well and good just automatically picking up all of this tax fraud, um, we can also create this scenario. Now, how much was this a problem with the algorithm, the Centrelink debt crisis? where the algorithm, um, the data was wrong and it picked up the wrong people, but also how much it was, even if the data was right, that suddenly overnight, a uh, department was able to just go, right, we haven't previously been enforcing this very well, and bang, now we're going to enforce it. And pretty big social impact associated with that. But the whole concept here of the idea of trust and winning back trust, um, how do we even build trust in the first place with algorithms? One of the kind of best examples I find with how do we build trust, especially through interfaces, is in the GPS area. Um, now people mostly trust their GPSs when they're going somewhere in a car, but especially at the start, nobody did. And you still get those times where you sit there and go, no, it's going the wrong way, that's a silly way, the data's wrong, why would you turn right down there? I'm just going to go straight ahead. And it's up to the interface to try to tell you information about hey, no, the reason that we're going to go straight ahead is because there's traffic over there, or the reason is that um, there's an accident or you've missed a turn or, or whatever. But at some point, building that trust with the user to say, no, no, it's cool, I've got this, just follow the damn directions, please. Um, really quite a hard problem you know, from that interface sense. As we go and start to expand into stuff like self-driving cars, you then need to add more onto this algorithm as well of, well, even if you trust the data, how do you go and inform it of what you want? I want the scenic route versus the fastest route. There's no point driving from Sydney to Wollongong and just barreling down the highway as fast as possible if you want to go and drive down past the Seacliff Bridge and through the Royal National Park and all that kind of nice stuff, right? Um, and now in the GPS world, um, even if people don't trust the algorithm, at least they're still in control and they can go and compare it. So you then end up with every taxi driver's dashboard or some of the Uber driver's dashboards. Um, this screenshot was nice as a comparison of GPSs. I'm not sure what happens if you turn onto Oracle Road. I assume you have to pay a significant toll and probably hand the car in and start walking from that point or something. <laughs> um, 
I would not want to pay that toll. So that's the battle of the GPS. Um, as we start to add all these other concepts in of how do we understand a, the best route to get somewhere. What is even the best route? How do we message that to users? When are we, um, you can see that there'd be an algorithm to work out for each user who likes lots of information while driving. I do, I sit there the whole time and there might be somebody else kind of navigating and they say, oh yep, no, you're all good, just keep going. And I'm like, but am I going for two Ks, three Ks? How far am I going? I want lots of information as a driver. Other users don't want that. So there's another algorithm that can go and learn what to apply there. Ultimately, all of this adds up, and when does it catch up with a human? So the idea of singularity, where computers actually get better at everything than us. And uh, Elon Musk's prediction, for one of just picking a prediction, is that that's about 35 years away. So it's a reasonable way off, and there's quite a bit of work to do, but it's not a really long way off. So coming in soon. So how do we go and run all this intelligence, though? It gets into the topic of compute, and compute is an area that's starting to change quite significantly as well. Um, we've had CPUs for quite a while. We've started to use GPUs in weird and wonderful ways. They were optimized for graphics. They're very good at processing arrays of, of data um, simultaneously. So you can take a whole array of information and then apply a common function to it all in a single clock cycle. So that's where GPUs are very, very good. And they're suddenly used in a lot of um, data and analytics problems. So Azure and AWS and everyone goes and rolls out GPU enabled um, infrastructure everywhere. As they go and discover sort of new things that we want to optimize in hardware though, we can't go and necessarily just rebuild all of these data centers in all of these cloud environments and go, right, now we're going to roll out all new types of ICs through them all. So we then get into the world of FPGAs. Um, these are field programmable gate arrays. And then the idea of something where the actual design of the chip at very, very close to the hardware level can be programmed in the field after the chip has been manufactured. So you can give it a very low level set of instructions that um, basically reroutes the signals within the chip. And then you can get that as a dedicated hardware device then to go and process what you're doing. So these kicked off um, largely out of Microsoft Research um, back in about 2010 was when they presented to, they went to find a problem of how can we prove this? And they presented to the leadership of the Bing team. And then they've gone and rebuilt Bing's index engine on this. Um, so maybe they don't work. But uh, they've then subsequently gone and rolled these out and they've seen significant improvements to speed and latency of all their real-time indexing and less compute power required and all of that. There's some great stats online about it all that they're quite open about. They've then gone out and been slowly rolling this out into every single physical server sitting in an Azure data center so that and they can then go to start to program new ways of processing problems at a near hardware level versus just virtualizing a VM. Um, you can actually go and download a whole bunch of simulators from Intel. You can write for them in a language called Verilog. And then you can actually go and buy FPGA kits for like 50 bucks from Intel. They have a thing called a Quartus, um, a Q -U -A -R -T -U -S, that you can go and put this kind of programming onto. Um, this here says that it takes an input, you're dealing at fairly low level stuff, creates a binary register. That input is a clock cycle, which in this case gets configured for a 50 hertz clock externally to this very log file. And then um, as every time the clock, files, clock fires, so line 16 says, whenever that clock input changes, go and fire this block for me. There's no like for loop or anything, it's triggered off that clock event. It increments the counter. And then on line 23, the LED output which is the, the wire defined on line four, the LED output is, matched, is mapped to the 25th bit. So what they've got is a 32-bit number, which gets incremented 50 times a second, and then they say skip to the 25th bit, so that's kind of like a few times a second, and then wire that up to an LED, and you get a blinking LED. And then you take this, you can synthesize it down onto a field programmable gate array, and all of a sudden you now have a essentially almost dedicated design chunk of silicon that's running a blinking LED. Everything revolves down to blinking LEDs. It's about the extent of my IoT experience with playing with pies and things. You get to the blinking LED and you're like, well, that's done, project done for the weekend. <laughs> so that's FPGAs. And then these are kind of an evolution of, uh, or so an evolution of, or can lead into the idea of application specific integrated circuits. So actually going and printing silicon or um, manufacturing silicon that does a very specific purpose. Um, the first people that really started to 
um, kind of in a well-known sense, go off and do a lot of this, was people who had a lot of electricity power to waste on incredibly complex calculations, all for the purposes of building out their blockchain. So um, uh, that's the first kind of application of ASICs that you see where people just can't even keep up with GPUs anymore. You have to have these dedicated blockchain kind of compute units if you want to go and compete in Bitcoin mining and things like that. Personally, I'm a bit kind of meh on blockchain at the moment. I think it's very um, right at the top of the hype cycle and is going to come crashing a very, very long way down. Um, the idea that distributed currency is a useful thing is kind of exciting. But at the end of the day, you have to be able to prove that you have some ownership over that underlying value. Um, a lot of the use cases talk about things like, well, um, you can put all of the property boundaries in there and then you can say who owns a particular property. And that way nobody can go and fake the data and move it around, which is a problem in some countries where the government just says you don't own that anymore. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter what the database says. You can put all the trust in there you want in the best ledger in the world. If you can't go and assert ownership over that asset in terms of muscle and guns and tanks and whatever, then it's not yours. So um, we've got this kind of trust ledger concept that's running in a very opposite direction to the actual physical kind of structures and the political environment of the planet. Um, when we then start to apply blockchain into corporate scenarios and it talks about trust between organizations, uh, I think we're currently grappling for use cases for it. Love to be proven wrong, but I, I think that's going to be on the, the well kind of crash down, but continue to monitor it. Um, the other place that's then starting to pick up a bit is the whole quantum computing angle. We're getting closer and closer to actually having a quantum computer, something which can go and uh, evaluate um, really complex scenarios in much more efficient ways for a generic statement, but based on um, largely probabilities, the whole concept of quantum and entanglement, it means that things like um, encryption suddenly need to change quite significantly. It also means that you can do stuff like sort a list in, of any length in a guaranteed period of time that we just can't do in a regular CPU like that, right? You have all these different sort algorithms. In a quantum computer, you can sort a list in a guaranteed consistent period of time. Um, our ability to model this at the moment, we can get up to five qubits. So a qubit, or about five, is the kind of reliable bit that we can model in a regular um, computing hardware before it gets overly complicated. And a qubit is one of these quantum bits, so something that can be a zero, one, and somewhere in between, depending on how you observe it, and all of those complex ideas. Um, if you want to play with it, there's a cool platform out there called QCL, uh, which is from IBM, and you can go and download that and run it up, and you can actually sit there and write small bits of quantum computing logic in their own custom language, and then it will spit out answers for you. But we're in kind of the five to 10 year range, it seems, for actually getting um, real quantum computing coming online in an accessible way outside of an R&D environment and available to us as a service. Um, getting our heads around it, quite a complex thing. Um, there's an excellent, excellent video of quantum chess. How many people have seen this? Paul Rudd, Stephen Hawking? Ah. So we've got Paul Rudd, Ant-Man, and Stephen Hawking playing quantum chess to save the world. And a message comes back from Keanu Reeves 700 years in the future, because he never actually ages. And he sends it back to Paul Rudd and then kicks off this quantum chess game to go and solve the world. If you just Google quantum chess, you'll find the video. It's about 14 minutes long. It is absolutely hilarious and uh, also quite a fascinating kind of explanation of some um, good quantum principles. The game in the video is actually based on a real game that somebody built out, um, uh, University of Berkeley or something. Uh, and the, the basic premise of it is one player goes to move and they move the queen and you know the queen has moved, but you don't know where the queen has moved until you go to make your move and that causes it to observe where the previous person moved and then it kind of plays out. So trying to play chess when you one move behind each other and having to predict the probability of where things might have gone. Um, they've then subsequently gone and done a Kickstarter, put some good graphics on it and put it up on Steam. So you can actually go and get quantum chess on Steam and go and play it. Um, at the end of the day, it's really kind of probability chess, but it goes through a lot of those quantum problems in a very interesting way. That's kind of a, quite a, a breadth of things there, right? So we've, we've talked through interfaces, we've talked through this kind of idea of 0D to 3D, um, trying to separate the idea of bots as a worker job from the idea of a conversational interface, and how does voice and everything start to play into that. Um, uh, talking about the idea of naught D, I really like that idea of ambient experiences that I don't think we have a lot of really at the moment. Um, trying to identify places where ambient experiences just successfully happen behind you. 
Um, I think the, that kind of conversational interface and as we get better language processing then really starts to become the consumer accessible, that kind of the next wave of consumer accessible IoT. So you don't have to go and do stuff like have the Philips Hue app and the um, Belkin Lights app and the, and the, and the, um, and that they all just start to participate in that model there. We're obviously seeing fundamental changes in the growth of 3D technology, VR and MR, of your Oculus Rifts and your HoloLenses and AR kit on iOS and all of that kind of stuff. The network, I think, is going to start to become more interesting as developers. We've kind of been able to ignore it for a little while. We plug it onto the internet and we talk to that endpoint on the cloud and, and off it goes. Um, now the idea of devices that you pull them out of a box and they just magically connect to a, a hotspot, I think, is really quite close um, which is going to be really cool, but it's quite a change to the carrier ecosystem. Intelligence, our role as developers is really how do we go and apply these into um, unique and interesting ways, taking the, the models and, and everything that's available to us via things like Microsoft Cognitive Services and all of that, and applying it in those unique and interesting ways, but also thinking about the experience and all the impacts of doing that, of not going and being the next Centrelink robo-debt crisis. Um, and then fundamentally, compute itself is getting uh, really quite interesting as well. I haven't even talked about stuff like containers or anything here, um, which is obviously that fundamental shift in virtualization, but the underlying technology is moving rapidly as well. So lots of different problems out there for us to solve. I think it's quite an exciting period in IT for us at the moment, or in technology, and, and what we can go and do and build on top of this and what's quite accessible to us. The idea of quantum computing as a service that you can go and kind of rent through the cloud is just going to be absolutely phenomenal. So there's also going to be lots more sessions today that go and explore into all the detail of this. So I encourage you to check all of them out. Thank you.